of a guy who might be a senator or a president someday? Well, well, perhaps so in 1996, but basically he's playing the game that is in Indianapolis. He is playing to do the best that he can to get for his party both both of the houses. In other words, the Senate is now 26 to 24 in favor of the Republicans. He is playing to also move the House from 50-50 to move it into the Democratic column. He is also playing at the game, so to speak, the conservative game. He's playing a very conservative game in terms of reapportionment in 1990. So as a conservative leader of a conservative Democratic party, he is attempting to win the House, win the Senate, and also maintain his position. Ray, what do you think? Uh, what's the governor shown us? Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm not going to get into the analogies that Dr. Rouse just used. Uh, uh, what we have here uh, in Evan Bayh, of course, and the voters uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, endorsed this when they elected him, is a very young, uh, energetic, uh, new person on the political horizon in Indiana. Uh, now, as we assess what he's done in his first year of office, uh, the criticisms that came out were primarily that uh, he has not uh, shown any leadership. That was a criticism in the past legislature. Uh, that he's, he's taking too long to learn, that he was inexperienced, uh, which goes along with his youth. Uh, he just turned 34 years of age is all. Um, I have a little different perspective on it. Um, as uh, you try to assess any administration in a short period of time of 12 months, you have to look back at what other administrations have done in uh, comparable uh, time pr frames. Um, and let me go back to what Governor Orr said when he was leaving office. Uh, Governor Orr uh, indicated in many interviews with the press uh, in his last month of office that uh, he really didn't seize the power of the governorship until late 1982, which uh, he was elected in 1980. Uh, and of course, he was facing a crushing budget deficit, uh, and he had to assemble all of the tools of governing together in order to address some very massive problems we had in the state, uh, recession and uh, budget deficits and what have you. Uh, so even Governor Orr, who is one of the most experienced governors uh, that we've ever had, uh, because he served eight years as lieutenant governor and was in the state senate prior to that, uh, admits that it takes a little bit of, of seasoning here before you realize the kind of powers and the kind of levers that you can grab onto, uh, even if you're experienced coming into the job. Uh, and I think uh, Governor Bai has demonstrated some of that. Uh, we had the first veto of a governor of a budget, uh, and he was in office only a few months, uh, while well, the first veto since, I think, 1963 uh, by a governor. So, uh, indeed, he has stepped forward in a number of areas to show that uh, he will lead. Now, uh, as to uh, uh, other seasoning, I think, indeed, uh, uh, it'll take a little bit more time. Twenty years of Republican governors before we get a Democrat, Bob Holt. Uh, did uh, Evan Bayh meet the expectations, I guess, that he led voters to believe during his campaign? I had occasion uh, to talk to some folks that traveled with him uh, during the United Way campaign throughout the state. And they have an employee's campaign, and they go up there, and occasionally the governor makes an appearance. Uh, and, uh, and the comments that I heard is how well-received he was throughout the state by the electorate, uh, how well-received he was by state employees. Now, whether or not their expectations uh, and the realization finally uh, uh, meet, we'll find out down the road. But uh, by and large, I think, uh, commenting on what Dr. Sheely said, uh, Evan is the first governor in 20 years not to have served in the legislature and not to have been a leader in the legislature and understood that process. And I think he has a period of time before he can, again, seize control of the and, and get the initiative. And, uh, and I think his fortune for the next two or three years are entwined with the legislature's. Yeah. Russ, uh... The governor has identified education as the key of the 90. That's the sort of thing that's not going to make anybody unhappy. No, uh, certainly not. I, I guess uh, in my short judgment uh, is that I do think uh, the Democratic governor looked at uh, Republican national politics and saw that uh, on taxation, you know, read my lips of George Bush. Uh, I do think the governor will try to hold the line on, on uh, tax and spend. 
Um, and I do think education should be a high priority. I guess the thing that I would like to see more in the education is the accountability. You know, what, what are our specific expectations? For instance, uh, not just raising test scores, but why not have a statewide program that uh, every child shall read uh, at a certain level before they go to the next grade level. I mean, let's get down to some specifics in education. I'd like to see that. But I think his biggest challenge is coming up. And what I guess I'm a little bit concerned with is uh, I don't know what his future ambitions are. But if we get into collective bargaining for public employees and that passes during his administration, will he be here to pay the bills in future years as the consequences of that action may take place. You know, you know, I agree with Bob that uh, Evan By certainly has a sense of presence. Some people would call it charisma. But as that conservative basketball coach who's lying back, so to speak, laying back, playing this four-corner off this four-corner offense, a very conservative offense, will the players and the fans the players, meaning all the prominent politicians, and the fans, the people, lose, lose respect for the leader. And so even though I agree with Bob that Evan Bayh has a great deal of presence, will, how, how much time does Evan Bayh, the governor, have before he begins to lose the respect of both the players and the fans? Well, of course, any analogy, uh, John, can be pushed to its uh, absurd conclusion. Well, I'm doing uh, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't see the governor uh, playing some conservative, uh, let's not blow a lead uh, uh, kind of game here. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's been very strenuous in a, in a number of areas, uh, starting with the legislature and the veto of the budget. Uh, he's been very uh, pronounced in terms of uh, reorganizing state departments. Uh, he has finally taken the initiative to try to solve something in terms of our prison uh, situation in this state. Uh, he's inherited a lot of things that have, have uh, uh, that he's also addressing in a very frontal way. Uh, I don't see him as uh, laying back on some public opinion poll lead and saying, uh, well, let's not rock the boat. Uh, he understands there are problems in Indiana, and, he's, uh, and I think he's very forthright in trying to address them. I guess, uh, Bob, from what you say, even what uh, Ray has said, that... Uh the 1990 election is really going to uh, help shape the Bayh administration, that come November when we find out what the legislature looks like, then we're going to find out what the Bayh administration is going to be like. Right now, and I think the legislators will tell you this, there isn't anything being done in Indianapolis by the administration or the legislature, both parties, that isn't political, that isn't being weighed against uh, what it is going to mean in the 1990 uh, election. Uh, that's the big casino in uh, state politics because that's the reapportionment of the legislature. Uh, the governor right now is a Republican Senate and a 50-50 House. Uh, that close, uh, it's very close. And if you look at the forms of legislation that are being presented, and some that I was telling Russ earlier, that are getting out of committee that you would not have had out of committee two or three or four years ago. Uh, on the And the governor, by uh, helping sponsor some of these bills, are, is, uh, is responding to his uh, constituency. Organized labor, uh, the teachers, the environmentalists, uh, those folks who would normally not, uh, uh, perhaps not get the hearing they would like in a, in a Republican-controlled uh, legislature. Democratic governor, uh, divided House, a Republican Senate. Are we dealing with a government by coalition now? Uh, certainly in the House we are. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and what Bob said is exactly true. We're going to see a lot of bills, and we did last session, uh, come through there simply because we have a Democrat chairman of a committee one day and a Republican chairman the next and a Republican uh, speaker one day and a Democrat. So, so both sides are getting uh, whatever bills they introduce uh, through the process. Uh, and this is the first time it's ever happened in Indiana. Okay, that we have, in effect, a 50-50 split, partisan split in the, in the House of Representatives. So when we're taking a look uh, that perhaps Governor Bayh hasn't asserted himself uh, well enough in the legislature, uh, we've got to look at a very unique legislature. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I think that increasingly it's evident, and the governor himself has said this, that uh, he is going to be a leader in this short session of the legislature. And I doubt if we see all of these come to fruition uh, in the final days of this short session. But right now, they, the coalition is putting them through. 
The dangerous point uh, is what happened in some other pieces of legislation with Doc Bowen uh, that he ultimately, as governor, signed. Uh, the House says uh, we're going to pass this in committee, and surely they won't pass it on the floor. Uh, and then uh, because of all these political considerations that comes out of the House and it goes over to the Senate, and we say, we're going to let those guys over there, you know, they're more stable, they're more experienced. They'll take care of this piece of legislation. And they say, hey, we're not going to be the guys that are step up and get... Uh, uh, clobbered on this, so we'll just let the governor do it, because we know that we've got a good Republican governor or a good Democrat governor, and he's going to take care of our philosophy. Uh, and, but, but, and then the governor. And then the governor. Signed, the teacher's <laughs> yeah. bargaining bill is one mm -hmm. that, sure. that that went through the whole process, and Bowen said, mm -hmm. hey, but all of you folks are for it. Who am I That's to right. be against it? And he signed but, it. But, yeah, but, but, but don't we beg the question when we say for George Bush that he has a democratic Congress and we, he has a coalition government, so therefore he cannot do anything. We say essentially the same thing for Evan Bayh. He has a Republican Senate of 26 to 24. He has a House that's 50-50. Doesn't the, this put more uh, focus upon the leader to be, as I've said before, the priest? the pastor, the teacher, what is Evan Bayh as our leader? What is he going to leave, leave with us as citizens? How can he encourage us to be better than we are? I think a governor has a better chance of being a bigger influence within his uh, pond than the president does within his ocean. And so, I, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, the, the interesting thing, and you all may shed some light on it, is sometimes the turf and egos involved between the Senate House and the governorship, and uh, I mean, within a party. And how do you all see the the turf territory and the egos among the Democratic leadership and the governor? <clears throat> well, let me say, I, I don't uh, know whether or not Governor Bai is on a grand scheme to someday go to the United States Senate or the White House, but I think it's very clear he is on a grand scheme to get reelected. Uh, <laughs> since we instituted uh, two terms for governors in Indiana, uh, every governor that's been there has wanted uh, to seek re-election and win. Uh, so in that sense, uh, as you extend this out, the legislature may be looking just to this coming November and their chances of retaining uh, their seats, but the governor is looking to 1992. Uh, and in this sense, uh, he is perhaps a leading in terms of the public opinion polls. He understands uh, his neck is on the line and he faces the voters with his name on the ballot. Being a leader seems is one thing, but obviously being a statesman, uh, the first rule of being a statesman is first you got to get elected, no matter exactly. uh, you know what you have. And, and Evan Bice seems to be facing that as well. Is that perhaps being a leader, John, is something he needs to be uh, theoretically, but in fact practically, there's nothing he can do better for himself than to be a politician this year and help Democrats get elected to the legislature. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think you get, uh, people like me who would say he needs to be a leader, I think it's incumbent upon the folks like myself to say, well, what do you expect him to do? What do I expect him to do? What do you expect the governor to do? Well, I think the governor could be very original by having every high school student learn Japanese. That's your idea. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> that'd be unusual. For, for example, if this state How about if they could leader, just re read our own Do you English have that written language? down in the notes there, John? Yeah, before we get to Japanese, can we just read our own language? Yeah, let's start with English. <laughs> okay, okay, let's start with English then. <laughs> okay. Let, in, terms of, in terms of the major, you ask the question, what is the major focus of the governor of the state? It's education. It's education and highways, things like that. Okay. Somehow, Evan Bay has to get above the politics, and he has to be the teacher, the priest, the pastor, and say, what can I lead the people to do so we can have a better citizenry, so we can deal with competition from the Japanese? Wouldn't it be, I'm serious about this Japanese thing. I mean, if we had a high school program in Indiana where we learn foreign languages, German, French, or whatever, so we could compete, and it would be a model in terms of foreign languages, international business for the entire country. It would come right from Indiana, and it would be something that the governor would push as something that is above party. Well, I don't, I don't disagree, and that's my opening comments were about specifics in education. I, I'm tired of the generalities. Let's raise the test scores. Let's attack the dropout rate. Let's see some specific programs to accomplish those things. Okay, well, Russ, let me ask you this question. How can you have this without more taxes? 
Well, I, I think you can have a lot more in government without more taxes if we would spend our current tax money more intelligently. We've got our priorities screwed up. Okay, it's okay, but 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 shouldn't we identify those priorities and identify where it's fouled up? You bet. And 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 focus and perhaps yeah. the governor could help do that. Well, if we had a Grace Commission within Indiana similar to the Grace Commission within the federal government, Grace Commission identified all kinds of federal waste in government, and we've yet to attack most of those. Uh, if we had the political guts to follow through on some kind of uh, uh, commission that would look at waste, we identify them, then we don't do anything okay. about it. Well, let me ask Bob this question. Corporate sector, Bob, isn't it incumbent upon the corporate sector then to come forth with a grace commission to point out these kinds of concerns? I would think that if you don't have the, the private-public sector partnership, uh, they're uh, out in the wilderness whistling. It's just, uh, it, it, it isn't effective unless you have your governor, the head of your government, president, the governor, in Muncie, the mayor, uh, say, okay, we're going to have a task force that's going to study government efficiencies. Uh, and when you're all done, I'm going to do something with right. it. And that's the other side of the country. I think uh, the governor, you know, has... Uh, there's a, there's a metamorphosis of, of the, the life of a governor. He reaches the last two years of whatever his final term is, and he's a lame duck. Uh, he starts out the first two years, and he inherits the problems of the preceding uh, administration. Uh, not only the problems, but those things that have been moving through the, through the system. I think that may be true of Governor By. For instance, corrections is not a new thing, but it's coming to a head, and it's coming to a head in this uh, uh, this next biennium, and they're going to spend uh, $66 million to build a, a new maximum security prison and another $22 million to raise the level of salaries and other things. Uh, so it, that's going to be a big item, but it isn't new. Uh, the uh, environmental issues are ones that have been just sitting on a rail siding someplace waiting uh, to be brought out to, to, brought to somebody's attention. Another one is the whole uh, public, uh, the, the uh, public uh, sector's uh, involvement with uh, uh, food stamps and, uh, and welfare. And uh, the governor has a tremendous program of uh, taking, right now, of taking those uh, 72 commissions, boards, divisions, whatever they are, and putting them together under one that's called a mega board by those who are uh, opposed to it. But uh, that's, uh, that's something that I think he has started himself and in the next session of the next biennium, we'll, we'll bear a, a, a governor by stamp while these other things are being taken care of just because it was their turn. So if he's there eight years, his first two of our initiation, his last two are lame ducks. So he really has only four years of that eight to, to put his own print on. I think so. Uh, let me say one thing again in historical perspective to follow up on what Bob, if you look at the Indiana governors uh, in the 20th century, you've got Paul McNutt, uh, you've got Harry... Henry Schricker, uh, you've got uh, Otis Bowen uh, as obviously the three most sterling governors that uh, left off, came into office popular, left office popular, uh, and also during their uh, watch, so to speak, uh, enacted major pieces of legislation that changed this state uh, for a long time. Uh, I think Evan Bayh has that capability, certainly his poll ratings show that he's as popular as uh, some of these past uh, uh, strong governors, but we'll have to see whether or not he actually can deliver. He's going to need a legislature. Uh, Otis no Bowen had a legislature. Uh, the best uh, legislation coming out of Governor Bowen's term was bipartisan in nature, and I think that the Governor Bay better understand that. Uh, it's got to have uh, both sides of the aisle agreeing to get major legislation accomplished. And I think, by the way, Governor Bayh does understand that. The folks will tell you that you get your uh, biggest, uh, the best pro progress uh, when you have a very close legislature, mm -hmm. 26 mm -hmm. to 24, 50-50, mm -hmm. because uh, you have some party discipline that you can impose and people can, the governor can, and people will move together. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have, uh, during those periods when the Republicans had uh, 75 to 25, that was a tough, tough house for the leadership exactly. to control because they were, off going and doing their own thing. Figuring they could do anything. Mm -hmm. if, if I could change the topic a bit, we know that uh, Evan Bayh has been confronted in recent weeks by the Crawford scandal. And we're not going to really focus on the dynamics of the Crawford, Crawford scandal. But uh, the question that comes out of this is the base of political support for the Republicans and the Democrats. They were, the Republicans have 
their base of political support coming out of Indianapolis, Marion County. The Democrats have a great deal of their base coming out of Lake County. My question for you, do the Democrats not have a problem in getting good qualified people to serve in state government? Whereas the Republicans had this big pool in terms of the corporations in Indianapolis, Lake, Indianapolis, Marion County, the Democrats going to their base in Lake County with Jack Crawford, is there a problem for the Democrats in Indiana in terms of getting good qualified administrators? That's ridiculous, John. <laughs> well, I think the fact, well, if you John, use Jack Crawford's example, uh, yeah, that's but, well, we could look at uh, Governor Orr's administration. The head of the corrections goes to jail. Okay, uh, uh, Harold any, Nagley. I'm asking a question, right? Any that that could happen. In all fairness, to any administration, national level, state level, in any state. Uh, so, I mean, it was an unfortunate circumstance, and I don't know that it was handled necessarily the the best way to handle it. But that could happen to anybody, unfortunately. One of the conjectures that you hear down in the big city is the fact that, uh, uh, you know, there are two or three people that came from Massachusetts, several that came from North and South Carolina that are department heads. As a matter of fact, I would say most of his major department heads are from out of the state. Uh, it's not quite a majority, but several. Yeah, yeah several. and, and the, the, uh, the gossip in the, in the state house is that uh, he's bringing these people in to build himself a national constituency and have leaders to go back when the governor decides to run for president or some okay, other wonderful thing. Mm. Bob, I, I, think, I think you're getting <laughs> at the point. Ray, the question again. I don't believe in such conspiracy <laughs> theories, okay? <laughs> Ray, I'm asking It's an opportunity question. to get on the ground floor, Ray. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, do the Democrats have a problem in bringing good people into government? Managers. Managers. Well, the, the, the question is, what does the rank and file longtime Democratic Party supporter think of these out of state people heading up uh, by his administration? You know, what does that say to, to the rank and file who had hoped maybe that with a Democratic governor, more of them within Indiana would be given those opportunities? Well, to quote Bob Devaney, Russ, I don't know why we should uh, uh, deny a person from Massachusetts the opportunity to work in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if I was football coach in Nebraska with the or population, the Nebraska with the population base they had, yeah, I'd feel that way too. Well, I mean, well. It, it, it goes back to the point that the Democrats were out of office for 20 years. Uh, perhaps the Democrats, in terms of their base, they might could go to the to the universities in terms of skills, knowledge, uh, uh, people who have expertise. Uh, you know, I just don't know where Evan Bayh goes. For example, the Republicans could depend upon the corporations for people who would go into government for a certain amount of time and then leave. And my perception is that perhaps the Democrats do not have that luxury in terms of going to that pool of talent. Not as much, maybe. I think that there would be a greater pool of talent available to a Republican governor, but Certainly, there is a sufficient a, a pool, I think, for Democratic government. So, so, so I, I guess what you're saying is that the Crawford scandal is no, is not symbolic of any kind of malaise in the Bay administration. That there are good people, it's just that this bad yeah. publicity is coming out, and all the good is getting papered over by bad publicity, poor pub, uh, publicity. Well, as a matter of fact, I think the governor uh, did exactly the right thing with Jack Crawford and then he fired him. Uh, and fired him very quickly when uh, the evidence was clear what the man was doing in the Lottery Commission. Uh, now, how can that be bad, public policy? How can that be a reflection on anything other than, uh, than what uh, Mr. Crawford did? Well, I think it's, a, it's an unfortunate thing for the governor because I'm afraid that that one scandal is, is coloring the entire administration. Well, Jack Crawford was a guy who worked hard for Evan Bayh in Lake County, there's no doubt about it. And the appointment, while uh, it on his face was good, you had an experienced prosecutor here who who was a, 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 who'd managed a large office in Lake County, who had a good record, a state police investigation that showed he was a, a, an all right guy, and uh, he had worked hard for Evan Bayh. So uh, it seemed to be a pretty good appointment on his face, and the lottery got off to a great start. Uh, obviously, uh, Jack Crawford turned out to be something more or less than the uh, investigation showed. Yeah, but it was, it was more of a personal failure rather than an administrative failure. So. And the only thing that, that I hear outside of the myriad of Crawford jokes that have sprung up overnight, but uh, is the fact that they thought maybe the administration, the young guys in the administration, the young attorneys overreacted. 
and say that they didn't do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Some people say they might have overreacted, they might have done it a little bit differently, but the end result yeah, would sure. probably have been the same. Um, just handle maybe a little more smoothly. Yeah. Okay, but, Ray, um, let's, uh, let's give Evan by a, a Democratic legislature this election. What would we get out of him in 1991, 1992? Uh, an A. An A? Yeah. <laughs> what, Being what, a professor, I'll What would you, expect, what would you expect? I mean, you certainly certainly a collective bargaining legislation for public employees. Uh, what else would you expect? Of? Sure. Uh, there's obviously going to be... Uh, uh, He's got to, the collective bargaining isn't the only solution to public employees. One of the problems we've had in Indiana, because we're a patronage state, is both parties through the years, or through the since the depression, frankly, uh, uh, we haven't created a managerial public administration uh, people in state government, because both parties, well, when I win, the other rascals are out, and vice versa. We haven't created a way to get everything uh, into 30 minutes either. We're out okay. of time. Uh, Thanks to okay. John Rouse, Ray Sheely, Bob Holt, Russ Sloan for being with us today. I'm Larry Law. See you next week. Public Affairs Roundtable is produced in the studios of WIPB Channel 49 on the campus of Ball State University. The producer is John Rouse. Listener comments are welcomed.